This morning we're going to take a look at the parable that was just read to you a few moments ago by Paul. But before we get into that lesson, what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about some about parables and, and uh, exactly what are they. Jesus told about 50 parables in the Gospels. At least that's what we know of. That's what's recorded there. We believe that he probably spoke a lot more parables than that, but 50 is what we have. And parables are unique in the way that they are used to teach a lesson. They're not a lecture. They're not a structured lesson, but rather they're just stories. And sometimes they're not even a story. They're just a a phrase and so many times uh, you may have even heard that uh, a parable is a um, has an earthly meaning with a, a earthly story with a heavenly meaning and there's some truth to that because what it's doing is making a comparison we get the word parable from the Greek word parabole and it's made up of two words, bola, which means to throw or throw down, and para, which means alongside or along or next to. And that's the concept of a parable. It's to make a comparison between two things or two items. And so that's what we have as a parable, two things that will be compared with one another. And so parables were a powerful teaching tool that Jesus used to convey truth to people. And in his hands, parables were an amazing tool. And it's amazing what would happen when Jesus had told his parables. Sometimes people were caught completely off guard because they didn't realize that the parable was actually about them until the end of the parable. And sometimes some of the people didn't even have a clue as to what Jesus was talking about. But see, the beautiful thing about parables is that they're stories and that they were easy to remember. And God blessed their hearts, you know, after a time as they thought about that story and re-ran it over and over again in their minds. Sometimes they came to understand what the meaning was and what it was that Jesus was trying to teach them. And so, Jesus is telling an amazing story here again, especially in this one, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. This parable is often referred to as the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Now, Jesus is speaking to an audience in which some of the Pharisees are in attendance, and Luke tells us in verse 9, who he's actually targeting in that parable. And it's to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Now picture in your mind's eye, if you will, Jesus tells the audience that two men are going up to the temple. But he tells them that one's a Pharisee and the other's a tax collector. And I'm certain that when he said that, their ears must have perked up. Because you couldn't have had two more different people at the ends of a spectrum than a tax collector and a Pharisee. And so, but there are some similarities between these two men. Both of them were Jews. Both of them are going up to the temple. And both of them are going to pray. But that's pretty much where the similarities between these two men end. But it's their differences that make the, them stand out so vividly. Now, the key to understanding this parable is knowing who and what these two men represent. So, let's take a look at the Pharisee first. According to Paul, who had actually been a Pharisee at one point in his life, he called them the strictest sect of the Jews. According, uh, and not only that, they had like a laser focus on obeying all the commandments and trying to keep the law to their best ability. And 
There's really nothing wrong with that, is there? To keep God's law? Well, that's what they tried to do. And they were the strictest of the sects in trying to do that. And they also had a, uh, an idea which was uh, somewhat strange in that they, they believed that if everyone in Israel could keep the law for just one day, that the Messiah would come. Well, I'm just grateful that that wasn't written in stone because we'd probably still be waiting for the Messiah to this day. But it was uh, something that they believed so uh, in depth about the fact that how much they needed to obey the law of God. And they wanted all of Israel to live according to God's commandments, which was a good thing. But here's where they began to go astray. They were so determined not to violate the commands of God that they did what's called fencing. They began to develop rules and regulations around the commandments of God in order to prevent people from violating the commandments of God. And these rules and regulations, they made up. They were man-made rules and regulations. They weren't set forth by God. And oftentimes in the New Testament, when we see the Jesus in a confrontation with the religious leaders, it wasn't over Jesus potentially or breaking the laws of God. It was violating one of these man-made rules and regulations. And so they just wanted to make sure that they didn't even come close to breaking the actual commandments. Here is uh, one of the key points of this parable that we need to understand that Jesus wants us to see. And that is this Pharisee as being typical of someone who trusted in themselves and their own righteousness and treating others with contempt. And we see that in verse 9. Now, I don't want you to think that all of the Pharisees were the same because they weren't. We know, for example, a, a couple of exceptions, Nicodemus, Gamaliel, and Simon. They, uh, they weren't as some of the Pharisees that we are going to talk about here in a few moments. And there were probably many others that weren't what we might consider villains. And without a doubt, there were a group of Pharisees that almost made it their mission in life to hound Jesus throughout his ministry. Now, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus talks about these Pharisees. He, matter of fact, he called them hypocrites and uh, brood of vipers and blind guides. But not all Pharisees were like that. But this Pharisee that Jesus describes in prayer, well, his attitude is very vivid. Here we see that he makes a, a statement in his prayer of basically what he's doing. He's doing self-congratulations, okay, of thanking God that he's not like other men. He's not an extortioner, which was a good thing. He wasn't an extortioner. Uh, he's not unjust. That's a good thing. And he wasn't an adulterer, which was also a good thing. And then he makes a comment, especially like that tax, tax collector over there. You see, and so after mentioning that he doesn't do what he doesn't do in verse 11 and casting an insult toward the tax collector, he talks about what he does do. Uh, look at verse 12. He says, I fast twice a week. Do you realize that he was fasting a hundred times more than what was required by the law? They were only, the Jews were only required by law to fast once a year during the Day of Atonement. And then he says, I give tithes of all that I get. That is, that he gave 10% of everything that he had gotten. And that wasn't required either. They were only required to give 10% of their, the production of the field and of their cattle. And, but is there anything wrong with, you know, fasting twice a week? Is there anything wrong with giving 
No, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But those things that he's doing are just ordinary righteousness. They are devotion and religiousness. So what's the problem here? Well, this Pharisee is assuming that by doing all these things, by list, listing his accomplishments, that he makes himself right with God. And he's also assuming that anyone who doesn't do these things or is like him is, isn't justified or right before God. And he's talking especially about the tax collector and others like that. And so, well, we also know something about the tax collector. He's just the opposite of the Pharisee, at least on the opposite end of the spectrums, morally and religiously. They're completely worlds apart. And so he wasn't part of the aristocracy of his day or part of the ruling class like the Pharisee was. Tax collectors were social outcasts. They were notoriously dishonest. They victimized their own people. And so you can imagine how the Jews viewed tax collectors because here is someone, one of their own people, who is working for a, a government that they despised, collecting taxes for a godless government, and they were seen as traitors. They were regarded as unclean ceremonially as well as religiously by the other Jews. And so the tax collectors also had a nasty habit of collecting too much taxes and pocketing the extra for themselves. And that's how they became rich. They were getting rich off the misery of others. And how do we know this? We know this because of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19? Zacchaeus wanted to see the Lord, but he was short in stature and he couldn't see over the crowds to see the Lord. And so what does he do? He runs down the road, knowing the path in which the Lord was going to take, and he climbs up in a sycamore tree. And as Jesus is coming by, he's hoping just to catch a glimpse of him. And when Jesus comes by the sycamore tree, he stops. He looks in the sycamore tree and sees Zacchaeus. He says, Zacchaeus, come on down from there. Today, I am going into your home. Can you imagine how Zacchaeus must have felt? He must have been beside himself. I mean, here is the most famous, sought after rabbi in all the land. And he is going to come and eat at my home a man who is rejected as an outcast by society. And so he goes to Zacchaeus' home. And while he's there with Zacchaeus, he gets to know the Lord. And, and Zacchaeus repents and he says to him, I give half of my stuff to the poor. And if I have done anyone unjustly, I will return to him what I have taken. But he goes beyond that. He doesn't just say, I'm going to return equal for equal. He says, I'm going to return it fourfold. And that's all because Jesus had gone to his home. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus was criticized so often for associating with them, because they were seen as unclean. But notice how much different the tax collector's prayer is from the Pharisee. For one thing, he stood afar off. You ever wonder why he did that? Well, why did he stand off from everybody else? Well, maybe he felt that he didn't even deserve to be in the temple. Maybe he didn't even feel that he should have even been mingling with those others who were worshiping there. And then maybe he felt that he may not have been welcome. And after what we've learned about what the Jews thought about the tax collectors, that might have been uh, he might have been justified in that feeling. But in verse 13, it tells us, he would not even lift up his eyes towards heaven. Now, that's not really a big deal to us today because, you see, the Jews, when they would pray, their posture was to hold their hands out like this and look up towards heaven as they prayed. 
And this Jew wasn't even doing that. And so, you know, the other, that caught the attention of the audience. And so, but what's he do? He, he has his eyes cast down and he beating on his chest and he says, be merciful to me, a sinner, a sign of shame and agony. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector's prayer was a prayer of humility. His prayer had only one request because he, it was the only thing that he dared to ask. Forgive me, be merciful to me. You know, sometimes we might feel sorry for the tax collector that maybe he's being too hard on himself. We shouldn't do that. To do that would ruin the story. You see, the story was meant to shock the audience. And neither are we to view the Pharisee as the villain in the story or the, ta uh, the, the tax collector as the hero. Because if we do that, we miss the point of what Jesus was trying to make in this parable. So what's so striking about this parable is what the tax collector offers up in prayer. He, he first of all, he doesn't do a self-congratulation as the Pharisee did. He doesn't parade his good works before God, just a heartfelt, honest plea for God's grace and God's mercy. What's so striking about this parable also is the ending of verse 14, where Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. You see, no first century Jew who that had heard this uh, parable or was looking upon the scene that Jesus was depicting would have expected that the seemingly righteous man would not have been justified but that the sinner was justified so let's make a further contrast between their two prayers that they offered in the Pharisees prayer he doesn't acknowledge any need he didn't seek any blessing admitted no sin and asked for no mercy. He enumerated his virtues and he closed with an insult casted in the direction of the tax collector. Burton Kaufman put, put it this way, he had a big eye on himself, a bad eye on the tax collector and no eye on God. Although God was mentioned, the prayer was actually with himself and probably rose no higher toward heaven than the top of his head. The tax collector, on the other hand, was short. It was, his prayer was short, informal, and warm with the earnestness of a soul burdened with sin. He confesses that he is a sinner and asks and sought out God's mercy. And it was shown by his not even looking up toward heaven with his eyes cast down and beating his chest in sorrow and in shame. This is one of the few prayers, by the way, that Jesus commends in the New Testament. So what was the result of these two types of prayers? Well, the Pharisee didn't receive anything. Why was that? because he didn't ask for anything. You know, not only was his prayer useless and futile, futile, but it may have even been an affront to God. Now, on the other hand, the tax collector's prayer resulted in justification, and his first step was to, towards uh, getting God's grace was his repentance and his humility before God just as we should be before God as well. And humility is the most basic of all Christian characteristics and traits. You cannot follow Jesus and not have humility if you can't acknowledge what you are in need of. And this Pharisee showed that he had no need at all. If you have no humility, 
then why would you ever turn to God? Why would you ever need God? Jesus also says in verse 14, everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I want to ask you a question. Which of these two men in the parable do you most resemble? You know, I think that's what we're supposed to do with these parables. Put ourselves in the story and to ask, where do I fit in here? Who do I more closely resemble? When you think about the parable of the sower, where Jesus describes the different soils, he talks about the hard soil and the shallow, rocky soil and the thorny soil and the good soil. Do you ever wonder, which of these am I? You know, if we're honest, we would probably answer uh, to those, at, at differently to, those, to that question as to which soil I am at different times in our lives. We always want to say, well, I am the good soil, right? Because that's what we want to be. We want to be the good soil. But sometimes we're hard-headed ones who will not listen. And sometimes we let those things uh, in the world choke out the relationship that we had cultivated with God in our lives. And so which one of these are we? Well, I think it's the same answer for all of us. It's going to vary from time to time. Sometimes we're more like the Pharisee, and sometimes we're more like the tax collector. Martin Luther, the great reformer, once said, even our best works are tainted with secret vice of pride. You know, we cannot stand before God on the basis of anything that we've done. The parable of the Pharisees and the tax collector is intended to cause us to rethink what it is that makes us right with God. It's not our own righteous works or acts of good deeds that does it, although as important as those things are, but it is acknowledging our sinfulness and throwing ourselves on the mercy of God as the tax collector did. That's what Paul said in his gospel in Ephesians, uh, about the gospel in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 where he wrote, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. We will not be able to stand before God and boast of our righteousness as this Pharisee did and expect that it has earned us something. Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 6, he says there that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And then in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 tells us, none are righteous, no not one. And then in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think there were two points that we could take away from this lesson this morning, from the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, and it's this. The first is, it warns us against self-righteousness. It also, it comforts us in knowing and having the knowledge that sinners can be right with God. We can be justified, that is, made right with God, regardless of our sins. Jesus chose a tax collector because the Jews, Jewish mind there was, uh, mind of, of what a tax collector was, is that they were the worst of the worst. And that, yet, this parable shows that even the tax collector could receive God's grace. And I think the biggest mistake that we can make here today is to leave thinking, thank God I am not like the Pharisee. Because if you did, you would be taking on the role of the Pharisee when he said, thank God I'm not like that tax collector. So the truth is we are all sinners 
And that's why none of us are saved except by the grace of God and his mercy. And that is, without a doubt, probably the greatest and the best news that we could ever hear here on this earth. And it was Jesus who has made it possible for us to receive that grace and his mercy by going to, cr to the cross and paying the debt of our sins for us. And the only way you can access God's grace and God's mercy is by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the way that you obey the gospel is first of all by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the Christ, the Messiah and the Savior. And then confessing that belief before men and then again repenting not repenting of sins as much as repenting by demonstrating your repentance of sin by turning away from sin and walking in the direction and walking in the way that God would have you to go. And then again to be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38, and what's in through the immersion of water. So if you have a need to uh, be baptized, you can let us know today. The waters are, can be prepared right quick. If you're not, if you are already a Christian, but have fallen away or have wrestling with sin in your life, you can come forward today and make your prayers and your requests known, and the congregation will pray for you. Whatever your needs are, come while together we stand and sing the invitation song.